a very melancholy Hamlet in his soliloquy said, to be or not to be? Well, that's the question. And yes, many people today struggle with that same dilemma as we face life's challenges, heartaches, and as Hamlet referred to it, a sea of troubles. Unfortunately, nowadays, many people are choosing not to be, and our rate of suicide is astronomically high. Well, here to talk about this public health crisis is our guest tonight on Medically Speaking. Please join us. Welcome to Medically Speaking. I'm Dr. Katherine Benny, your host for the show. Now, this show is brought to you for your good health by your county medical society as well as your county medical foundation. Now, worldwide, there are about a million suicidal deaths in the world. 250,000 to 300,000 of these deaths occur in China and some 40,000 in the United States. Certainly, the recent death of Robin Williams has been widely publicized, and we've heard a lot about suicide bombers as part of the Islamic uh, terrorist movement. Well, our guest tonight comes with a wide range of knowledge about suicide. She is a certified suicide prevention counselor. She has her master's in community counseling. She is the director of the Southern Community Services and also directs support groups as a facilitator, the Suicide Survivor Support Groups. And finally, in her credentials, most notably, she is a York College adjunct instructor, where she teaches the only suicide prevention course for credit at a PA college or university. And without further ado, I'd really like to welcome Cindy Richard. Cindy, thank you so very much for coming on nice, tonight. Nice to be here. It's really a distressing topic. How did you get to be so interested in it? In 2007, um, another coworker and I went to a conference on suicide prevention. It was a state conference, and we talked. We learned about older adults, and we just thought, well, we'll come back to York and see what suicide looks like in York County. And we were astonished, and we just could not um, go without you know, doing some work in that field. And so we've been doing this since 2007. Well, not to simplify the topic, uh, but we do know that suicide has no racial barriers, no cultural mm -hmm. barriers, affects rich and poor, highly educated and uneducated. And very famous people, we named uh, Robin Williams, but there's also Kurt Cobain, the mm -hmm. lead singer of Nirvana, and George Eastman, the, direct, the founder of the Kodak Camera, uh, Virginia Woolf, the author, on and on it mm -hmm. goes. Is there a certain common thread or characteristic amongst people who commit suicide? Most people that, that die by suicide, um, they have a depression issue. It's a mental health issue. Uh, they, they have clinical depression or even one step further, which I like to call suicidal depression, where it's just, they just cannot seem to get past um, some of their their medical issues and everything that happens to them on a daily basis is a struggle and that's so I would say depression would, is the bottom line and that's really basically the characteristic of every every person that dies by suicide is depression. Well in the past there's been a certain little stigma associated with uh, suicide. Mm -hmm. We never talked about it. It was mm -hmm. something that maybe somebody did way back when in your buried family history, nobody talked about it. Is it that we're talking about it more or is it actually more prevalent? Well, I can't say we're talking about it more. There is still a stigma. And in York County especially, I, I find that people see it as a selfish act. Uh, they see it as, you know, someone that doesn't really care about anybody but themselves. And it's hard to change people's thought process when it comes to suicide and, and l let them know that it is a mental illness. It's not something that they can c control themselves. So is it more prevalent? I think we're seeing it more prevalent because of the baby boomers. 
Uh, we have all grown, the baby boomers have grown up in, in high stress times and we may not have had the appropriate coping skills that we learned, you know, back when we were younger. And so we're, we're seeing more between the ages of 40, 60 that are dying by suicide. Oh, wait a minute. Everybody's been under stress. My goodness, our mm -hmm. parents fought in the Second World War. What could be more stressful than that? Uh, men going off to war, you never knew if they were even going to return. It wasn't just uh, people who were drafted. It was everybody was for the war effort. Hamlet, he was stressed. He didn't mm -hmm. know whether he wanted to go on and face this sea of misfortune, as he called it. We've always been stressed. Mm -hmm. That's true. And now we're even hearing about teenage suicide being on the rise. What do kids have to be stressed mm -hmm. out about? It's, it, the bottom line is coping skills. It's what they learn. It's how uh, are they taught to take care of stressful situations, relationships. You know, you can remember back, hopefully, when you were in high school and college. Well, we were you in know, now love every week. Yes, but there are well, kids nobody died that, over it. No, but there, people just don't have the coping skills that they used to have. And they are not, it, I don't want to say it's an easy way out because it's not. It's the, it's the mental illness mixed in with not having uh, the coping skills that they need to, to survive and to think that tomorrow's just another day. If they, if they get through tonight, tomorrow will be so much better. That's why it's so important for people to intervene and to, to show these kids, to show even adults, show older adults, that today is not the end of the world. Well, you've said it's a big public health problem. Mm -hmm. Just how big is it? What are some numbers for us? In York County, uh, we had 87 suicides this last year. In 2014? Yes. And so far this year, we've had 17. We had two today. 17 in just less than three months. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so it's the same number that we had at this time last year at the end of March, on the last day of March. So we've had nine suicides this month alone. And what age groups are you seeing? Most of them are between the ages of 40 and 60. We've already lost three uh, young adults under the age of 25 this year, whereas last year we'd only lost one at this point. But, you know, we're looking for zero tolerance. We have not had a month without a suicide in York County since December 1997. That's incredible. It is. At what age do you first start to see suicidal thoughts or ideation developing? I would, I, I see middle school. Middle school age seems to be where we're starting to see kids that are having some depression issues, um, being able to handle certain situations. In high school, we see the kids that are uh, perfectionists, that want to control everything. Everything has to be just perfect. Uh, and then that moves into college. You know, in college uh, age, the, the 15 to, or the high school college age, 15 to 24 year olds is very high in, in suicide. And um, I know I've talked to different um, security guards at all the three different schools that we have here. And every week they have five to 10 kids that come to them for suicide ideation. But you mentioned earlier intervention. Mm -hmm. What is it that we should be looking for? Are these people expressing their feelings, what, what they're feeling? Or, and what is it that they're feeling? Mm -hmm. Kids tend to talk to other kids. Uh, adults will talk to uh, their, their peers or the people they work with in the workplace. So what I, I feel is extremely important is everybody needs to be educated in suicide prevention. They have to know the warning signs. They have to know the risk factors. They have to know what it takes to, to keep someone alive, you know, and, and how to ask the question, how to persuade them to get help, and, and then how to refer them. So intervention right now is, is tricky because not always do they have a real strong suicidal ideation side. And so when they go to the doctor or they go to the crisis, it's not strong enough for them to leave, leave, uh, live there uh, or stay there. So uh, what we need to do is, is really show and, and the crisis intervention people and doctors that when someone is suicidal, they mean it. You know, it's not something that it's just they're, they're, they're playing around with. And you have to take suicide seriously. So when somebody comes to you and says that they're suicidal, 
you need to take them seriously. Most people who are contemplating or thinking about suicide actually express that to others? Yes. We did a um, survey about two years ago in York County, and one of the questions was, if you were at suicide ideation, if you know someone that has suicide ideation, who did they go to? And it was on a, a one to 10 spectrum. One being friends and family and peers, and the other end mental health workers. The last person they went to was a mental health worker. The first people they went to were their own peers, their family, their friends. So that's why it's so important to get people out. So if the person doesn't come right out and say, I'm planning to kill myself. What other signs would you look for? Depends on the age. Um, and, and let's say in adults, they're going to stop going to work. Maybe they have an addiction issue, alcohol or drugs. Uh, they're sleeping all the time. They, they just are really moody. They're angry. They're maybe driving erratically. They're just, their whole personality changes. Or they withdraw so much. And then they start giving away um, some of their important papers or their important things that they have at the house, you know, big things that they wouldn't normally give away. Um, and then they, if they have animals, you know, they may start giving away their animals. So a lot of it is behaviors and a lot of it is um, their emotional state changes drastically. You're saying a change in behavior that is out of character or giving away personal items. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, you said they would share these thoughts with others. Many people who, well, let's talk about the way they do c complete suicide. What is the most common ways? For adults, it's, it's guns, by, you know, gunshot. Um, for younger kids, it's, it's usually uh, drug overdoses or um, hanging. That's what it is in New York County. But, you know, men tend to complete uh, suicide more than women do. Women attempt four times more. So, but it's usually, it's, men usually use guns. And in York County, we have a lot of guns in our homes mm -hmm. because we have a lot of hunters. So, well, some people who commit suicide leave a note, famous last mm -hmm. words, if you will. Uh, why do they leave that note? Sometimes it's um, things they couldn't say to that person while they were still alive. Uh, sometimes the note just includes um, what they want to have done with their body afterwards, what type of funeral they may want. Uh, sometimes it's, it's, you know, all the accounts that they've had, you know, trying to make it easier for the, the wife or the children to take care of the situation. So uh, for we see notes left more in the, with the adults than we do the children. And what about afterwards? How does that suicide affect the loved ones that they leave behind? Suicide is probably the worst pain anyone can ever, ever go through. It's a different type of death. Um, grieving is different than, than losing somebody by cancer or a uh, heart attack or whatever. Um, Why they, is that? Is that because of unresolved guilt feelings? There's a lot of guilt. There's a lot of whys, what ifs. There's, um, it's, They've, ta they've taken their life with their own hands. And many, many people, especially wives and family members, are, are the last ones to ever believe that their, their loved one would do something like that. It's just really, really sad. And, and the grieving is very different than by someone that has lost someone in a natural way. Do you think that parents most often realize that their children children, young teens, are suicidal? Sometimes they do, and sometimes they have absolutely no idea. That makes it very difficult then for anyone to intervene if the family, the immediate family and friends are the most likely ones that the person in mm -hmm. crisis would go to or talk to. Mm -hmm. It makes it very difficult if they don't let them know or they don't even have a chance. And it's help. very difficult when they don't see it because they don't know the warning signs. Uh, or the or the the risk factors. Some people automatically know, especially if there's been a suicide in their family. They know what the warning signs are and they know what to look for. But but the common person really does not know 
what the warning signs are. And I think that's another reason why we're losing so many people in York County. Addiction and certain other mental illnesses run in families. Does yes. suicidal tendency run in families? Yes, because mental illness runs in families. Well, this is a very deep topic. We're going to take a small break and we will be right back. Welcome back to Medically Speaking. I'm Dr. Katherine Benny with Cindy Richard, and we are talking about the grave subject of suicide, a big public health problem here in York County. You seem to be very well versed on the statistics. How is that? Well, the coroners have been really great, both coroners, that since we started doing this 2007. Um, Barry Bloss was our coroner then, and now Pam Gay. And uh, they give me the, the deaths as soon as they happen, you know, all the suicides as soon as they happen. So we are putting together uh, a profile. We started this last year. It's going to be a three-year profile of what does suicide really look like in New York County? Why are people completing suicide? What are the triggers? What are, what are the behaviors? And um, hopefully we'll have the first year profile done within a month or two and and we put bringing it have out have you the any community. preliminary thoughts on these subjects many much of it is depression depression alcohol drugs uh, addictions well, we and certainly then, have had a lot of overdoses recently as yes, well the heroin yes we have had a lot of those and then when when they actually have an illness or something uh, that happens in their life a bad relationship you know their wife has an affair or their girlfriend breaks up with them or whatever it might be or if they have financial issues that's kind of the last straw that's that's the last trigger and they're already suicidal at that point so that didn't cause the suicide that was just kind of the last straw for the suicide now what about all of these medications such as Chantex and some of the antidepressants mm -hmm. All the uh, side effects and the labels read, well, this may accentuate or cause depression. Mm -hmm. Could these be contributing to suicidal thoughts as well? Very much. People have to know what, what medications they're taking and what are the side effects. A lot of antidepressants will cause suicide ideation. Uh, if you start a new drug, the person that lives with you or your friends or whoever need to really know that you've changed medications and to be watching for certain behaviors. Uh, I've, I've heard too many people that have gone down that path. Uh, and then on the other side of it too, you have to go and, and have your medication tested and making sure it's at a therapeutic level. So if you start self-medicating and you're also taking antidepressants, you need to check and make sure that your antidepressant doesn't need to be um, raised or changed or, you know, whatever, because you shouldn't be self-medicating at the same time you're taking antidepressants. At one point you mentioned there's a culture for suicide in York County. What did you mean by that? I think there's a culture that much, many of the people in York County, about 25% of the people in York County are over the age of 65. We have an older community. We have a community of people that know that they've always taken care of themselves and they will continue to take care of themselves. But about one in every five people that walk the street in York County have a mental health disorder. So we need to make sure that these people are getting the care that they need and that the stigma of mental health is raised so that people can start talking about it. We still have a huge stigma. Uh, towards mental health in York County. And a lot of people feel like they've always taken care of themselves all their life. They don't need anybody else to step in. Oh, well, certainly. I'm not kooky. I'm not loony. Mm -hmm. uh, they're crazy, not me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we just don't think about it. We don't want our loved ones to be suicidal. You know, that's that's just not something we we dream of in our children or in our parents and you know our, our siblings we don't dream of that happening to someone but we have to know 
where to go and we have to know how to take care of it if it is that way. Well, it's a difficult subject to approach. It's difficult to talk about. Mm -hmm. In fact, could you give somebody the idea of committing suicide by talking to them about it? Not at all. People that die by suicide don't want to die by suicide. They just want the pain to go away and they want somebody to listen to them. They want somebody to give them some hope, give them a reason for living. And if somebody is suicidal and you have somebody like that that's able to talk to them, don't give up on them. It may take 12, 15 hours of your time to talk to this person, to talk them out of suicide, but you really, really have to be careful and, and know that they're okay when you leave them because you can't leave them until that you know that they're, they're okay. I, I always tell people that if you're going to be talking to someone and you really feel like they're suicidal, ask them how. How do they plan on taking their life? When do they plan on taking their life and where? And if they know all three of those, if they can give you a, a clear-cut answer to all three of those, they need to be in the hospital because they have a plan. You mentioned that they, we should talk to them. Can one person who is not a trained healthcare professional talk them out of it? Sure. I think anybody that person will listen to. And if they don't feel comfortable talking to this person and trying to talk them out of completing suicide, uh, they need to find somebody that can or somebody that will help them do that, whether it's a minister or another uh, a counselor maybe that they're already going to, a doctor, a, another friend, it can, a teacher, it can, be, it can be anybody, but they have to know how to do it. And we have programs like uh, QPR, which is Question, Persuade, and Refer, where it's a gatekeeper program, where we teach people how to ask the question and how to refer them and how to persuade them to get some help. So if you've talked them out of the plan of killing themselves, mm -hmm. is that enough? Do they need any further follow-up? Oh, yes. If they go into the hospital, uh, the, the, when they get out of the hospital, first hundred days is extremely important because they will try to take their life again, almost guaranteed, uh, if there's nobody around because now they're back trying to cope with their everyday situations that were not going well before. So stay with them. Don't give up on them. Just because you get them in the hospital doesn't mean that you can drop the ball. You know, call them, send them a note, uh, go see them, and, and continue to, to let them know that, you know, I've got your back. I'm going to be there for you, you know, and anything you can do, you know, you need, you come to me for. And that builds that relationship, too. It builds that trust in someone. And it my, it keeps them alive. Now, at the beginning, they may not be ready for this, but I and they may get really angry. But I always say it's better to have an angry friend than a dead one because it's um, if they take their life, you're not going to have a chance to turn it around. So, if someone is planning suicide, you talk them out of it. Uh, should you take them right to the crisis intervention at the hospital? Is that what you're suggesting? I would talk to them. I would. I would. Listen to them. You don't want to give them too much advice because they're not going to take it. You, they want somebody to listen to them. So if you listen to them and you ask them certain questions, you know, so that do they have the capacity to, to take their life? You know, what's their intent? Do they have buffers? Do they have somebody in their life that keeps them from taking their life? That is extremely important. I call that the wall of resistance. Um, it could be a pet, it could be a child, it could be grandkids, it could be a husband or a wife, you know, it could be anybody that's very close to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, and sometimes it's a, a religious thing. They don't want to take their life because they're afraid they're going to go to hell. So that's that you have to hold on to and that's what you have to keep reminding them of. Uh, whatever it is, whether you believe it or not, that's what you have to tell them and to keep you them You mentioned alive. that you were a facilitator for a support group. Mm -hmm. What kind of support groups are these? These are uh, suicide survivor support groups, people that have lost people to suicide. Uh, we have one in Dover and we have one in Shrewsbury, in our office in Shrewsbury. And people come and they find out that they're not alone. 
that people are going through the same things because they have lost a loved one to suicide. Right now, the one down in Shrewsbury is growing. It's mostly women. We have a couple men. And some people can feel like they can come just weeks or days after they've lost someone to suicide. And sometimes it takes people six months to a year to actually do it. And we had we have one gentleman that, that comes, and, and he's he's lost two brothers to suicide, and it's taken him many years to come to a support group. But every time they come, they they, they leave feeling like they're not alone. Mm -hmm. It's a good feeling. And what is the purpose of the suicide hotlines? If you're feeling suicidal and you need somebody to talk to and say it's the middle of the night and you don't feel like you can talk to somebody, pick up the phone and call the number. And it's, I think we're going to show it on the screen, but it's, it's just somebody that, that has been through it before. If you're a veteran, you can talk to another veteran. And it's, it's just somebody that is really there just to listen to you. And, and hear what you have to say. And maybe let say, you know, you may need to be referred. You may need to go see someone. Who could you go see? Or is there somebody there at the house with you that's keeping you safe? You mentioned that people these days lack coping skills. Mm -hmm. How do we teach people these skills and what are they? We need to teach kids from day one, right after they're born, you know, that it is okay to cry. It is okay to... Uh, make mistakes. And what do you do when you make a mistake? You know, as you get older, you make a lot of mistakes and it can't be the end of the world. And kids need to learn how to fail, basically, and that it, that it is okay, that not everything is going to be the way. You cannot control everything in your life. And I think that's the problem we're seeing with a lot of high school kids now is they're so used to having everything just the way they want it to be. And when things go wrong, they have no idea how to, how to change that and how to make it right. And some things are pretty big. And, you know, we see kids that grow up in uh, abusive homes, and they may be afraid to make mistakes. And they may be because they're, they're beaten or they're abused every mistake that they make. So that's a whole other different situation. But um, sometimes kids grow up too fast and they've had to raise themselves and they don't want to do that anymore. So. We've certainly seen dissolution of the family unit. Families don't yes. eat together. In fact, they don't stay together. Mm -hmm. uh, there certainly isn't the support that uh, many of us had when we were children growing yeah. up. I think it's very important that, that families uh, listen to their to each other, not just to the kids, but they have to listen to each other. Relationships are built on um, on listening to each other, enjoying each other when you're around. But when things get really tough, being able to work together on on certain uh, even relationship issues. Uh, there's a lot of divorce in our our country now, and it's so easy just to walk out on a marriage instead of trying to fix it. You know. Mm -hmm. And um, I won't even go down that road, but I think it's, I think it's something that we need to fix, too. And know? quickly, is there some phone number or resource that our viewers can go to for more information? Mm -hmm. uh, you can call our office at 717-227-0048 uh, and ask for me. We have, Cindy Richard. Yeah, we have all kinds of information there. We have booklets that we redo every January for the year and gives you new information. And any uh, offices or anybody that in York County that wants these booklets, we certainly can do it. We also have a Facebook page for York County Suicide Prevention Coalition. And um, on the Penmar website, uh, we have... Information well, this has been too. most informative. We thank you very much for coming. This has been Medically Speaking. I'm Dr. Catherine Benny, ophthalmologist and retinal surgeon, wishing you good health, happiness, and a great week. We'll see you soon. Good night. <laughs>